The following is an encore presentation of a pre recorded program. To join one of our many live presentations, please visit cje.net slash events, call 773-508-1000, or follow us on your favorite social media platform. I'm Roseanne Corcoran, and I'm with CJE Senior Life Counseling Services. I'm going to host the program today. Um, but our keynote speaker is Nina, who you also see on the screen. Uh, I'm glad to be with you all this morning. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. Um, I am the addiction specialist and mental health educator at JCFS Chicago. For those of you who are not familiar, JCFS Chicago is a, a large behavioral health organization that does services for people throughout the lifespan, everything from working with very young children, uh, therapeutic day school, uh, we have a chaplaincy program for, for folks that you know, maybe uh, family members are in hospice and they want some help from a rabbi to bring comfort. And the program I'm with is called Community Services. So we do a lot of different things. What I do for community services is programs like this, community education. I also do professional training. And the thing that probably will be most helpful to all of you is because I am a substance use specialist. If you have a family member, friend, colleague, someone you're concerned about that has a substance use issue, I hope you'll feel comfortable contacting me. At the end of the program, I'll briefly show a slide with my information. You also can get my information from Michelle Mangrum and Roseanne Corcoran, who are helping me sort of uh, present all of this to you. Um, and also, I, I do want to take a moment to think to thank CJE Senior Life, Roseanne Corcoran, who I've worked with for, gosh, more than six years as a collaborator on many different programs. And I only met Michelle for the first time this morning, but she's our tech guru. So if anything goes wrong, I know that we can count on Michelle to, to get us back up and running. So without further ado, I'm gonna start my program. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And let's go ahead and find that program. And there we go. Hopefully you can see everything. So um, this program is called Helping when a loved one is misusing substances. And uh, that's actually, it's important for me to just briefly talk about that phrase, misusing substances. Through the 30 plus years I've been in the substance use treatment field, that idea of misusing instead of abusing or dependency is a much sort of nicer way of framing people's issues with substances. We don't want people to feel accused or judged when we're trying to help them. And so we're very careful about our language. And actually some of what we're gonna be talking about today has to do with the kind of language you use when you talk to your loved one, family member, friend, who you're concerned about. You know, Maybe they, they seem to be misusing substances and you wanna help them out. So that's really the end goal of this program today is help you to communicate with those people that you love and care about and are worried might be struggling with substance use issues. So let me go ahead and try and advance the slide. So here we are. So now these are the goals. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on recognizing signs and symptoms of substance misuse, but I'm gonna give you sort of a catch all way to really understand how to recognize that something's, something's off, something not, something's not going well. Then I'm gonna talk about what happens in the family when someone, a member of the family, be it the, older, the eldest child, and it might be a, an adult child, right? The, the parent, the, the, the male spouse or the female spouse is having issues with substances. What tends to happen is people take on certain roles to respond to that, Exist, you know, existing in the family and, and kind of how people cope with what's going on. And then finally, and this is, as I said a moment ago, the most important thing is to learn a more curative, curative way of helping the people that you care about, helping the members of your family that maybe are struggling with substance misuse. Well, here's some common substances. I thought that'd be kind of a good way so that we're all on the same page talking about the same thing. 
Um, I'm, in a minute, I'm gonna show you actually a slide that shows what the most prevalent substances being used are. I don't think it'll surprise you that the way I've actually put them on this slide is sort of represents what's being used the most from top to bottom. So alcohol far and away is the most commonly used substance. Obviously not everybody misuses alcohol, but enough people do so that we're, you know, we're putting that at the top of the heap. Now that marijuana is legal, both medicinally and recreationally in Illinois, it is definitely used a lot. And some of you may have read uh, in the news at the beginning of the pandemic that sales were really increasing for these two substances for marijuana, marijuana and alcohol, that there were lines out, you know, even though people were masking and social distancing, there were lines out the liquor store and lines out the marijuana dispensaries because people were isolated and lonely. And I think they felt like they would feel better and calmer if they used these two substances. Some of you may have read in the news very recently, very disturbing news about the latest information we have about opiates, that overdose from opiates, heroin and fentanyl have increased in 2020 to 2021 by 30%. So I know that while your family members or people you know may not be struggling with opiates, our community at large definitely is. By you know, a measure of 30%, we are seeing many more overdoses than we did prior to the pandemic. A lot of older adults use sedatives and tranquilizers, just so you know what I'm talking about. Things like Ativan, Clonopin, Xanax, some of the old time ones like Valium and Librium are still used, but not as frequently. I think a lot of you have heard about cocaine. It is not as prevalent as it once was, but it's still used. Amphetamines mostly uh, medicinally are used for people with attention deficit disorder or attention hyperactivity uh, de deficit disorder. Uh, methamphetamines, while it's at toward the bottom of this um, list along with tobacco, these are two, you know, tobacco, especially people that are vaping tobacco is definitely kind of higher on the list than I put here. And methamphetamines are sort of creeping up the list since the pandemic started and there's been an increase in substance use, methamphetamines is creeping up. So not to spend any more time on this, just really briefly to, so you can have a look. Now this was uh, 2019 data. Sometimes it's hard to get current data on uh, the use of substances. This is the most current I could find to give you a really good picture of how prevalent alcohol and tobacco are. Don't pay attention to Kratom, although it is being used, it's not to a great enough extent that we're going to worry about that today. Marijuana is probably now in 2021 much higher than is shown on this graph. I'd say the same definitely is true for heroin and, uh, and pain reliever misuses is, is actually fairly high up on this graph. But you know, in terms of how it occupies the larger amount of substance use, it's not as large again as alcohol, tobacco, or marijuana, but it's up there. So how do you know if someone you love is having problems with substances, if they're misusing substances? I'm gonna give you an overall idea before I show you any of the bullets on this slide, that what you most of all, if you're worried about a spouse, a family member, a colleague, a good friend, you know, someone that you see often, the best thing to look for is a change in their functioning. Are they showing up for the Zoom rooms that you're all, you know, are people that used to show up suddenly not showing up? Um, are people, even when you're just seeing them on squares on Zoom, do they look different to you? Maybe less well kept. You know, maybe their their hygiene's not as good as it used to be. Um, maybe they're um, sort of woozy or sleepy or you know, sort of seem sedated to you. So changing in functioning, are they getting their life done? Are they uh, having issues with relationships? Are they having issues with work if they're still working? So what's going on with that person? that shows you a marked change in their functioning. So I'm gonna now show you the bullets on this. So an easy one. So maybe this friend of yours, this family member of yours would drink you know, maybe one cocktail and a glass of wine during dinner, but now they're having two or three cocktails, two or three glasses of wine, and they're asking for an after dinner drink, right? So just increased use over time. 
is something to look at. Or maybe if you live with the person, you might observe that those sedatives are, you know, the, the amount that's in the pill bottle is really going down. That's also something you want to, you know, obviously you don't want to be the, the, the narc in your household, the police in your household, but especially if it's happening within your household, you may want to take a quick look at the medicine bottle if you're seeing a change in their behavior. Tolerance, the definition for tolerance as it pertains to substance use or substance misuse is using more and more of the substance over time to get the same effect that they used to get with less of the substance. So again, the example I gave earlier about they used to just have one cocktail and one glass of wine. Now, because they're just not feeling the effects of the alcohol from that amount, they're now increasing their, over, their intake because they want to get that effect. But they because their metabolism, their bodies become tolerant of the substance, they need to use more and more to get the same effect. You notice that they really can't control their use. You know, they used to be able to control and just have, you know, one joint of marijuana or one vape pen, you know, like a couple of puffs, and now they have to, to use more than they used to use. And maybe they're, you know, they're carrying extra vape pens so that they're sure to always have a, a, the amount that they want. Symptoms of withdrawal, if you're familiar. I mean, most everyone has had a hangover. So if someone that you know is complaining frequently of hangover symptoms, that's withdrawal, right? So that's not to say that everyone who has a hangover is having alcohol use, misuse problems, um, but withdrawal is a symptom. So if someone, for instance, is, seems very jittery and they tell you that they haven't had a drink in a week, that might be a clue that they have been misusing the substance alcohol and now they're having withdrawal symptoms. Or maybe they're just really concerned about, you know, just really worried that, you know, they're not gonna have enough alcohol in the house. You know, as you know, a lot of you can uh, probably acknowledge that at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of us ran out and bought alcohol and swabs and toilet paper. Well, someone who has a substance misuse problem is going to make sure they have a supply available to them. So if they're going out and buying a lot of alcohol, this is a clue, right? They're preoccupied that they have enough of the substance available to them. Giving up important activities. Um, I mentioned that earlier, a change in functioning that's really noticeable is something to be concerned about. And and they may even say to you, you know, my loved one, um, I'm starting to worry, you know, I, I'm starting to feel like really jittery in the morning. And I think it might be connected to how much alcohol I'm drinking. They may even tell you, I'm, I'm starting to realize that I have a problem, but then they keep on using. They keep on drinking, they keep, keep on using whatever that substance is, even though they've recognized that it's maybe starting to affect their functioning, affect their relationships, affect what's going on around them. So I'm gonna switch gears now. Um, you know, as you know, you can put questions and comments and thoughts into the, the Q&A. And I know that Roseanne and, and Michelle are kind of monitoring that. So if anything I've said raises a question for you, certainly I'm happy to address that when we're finished with uh, today's, you know, toward the end of today's program. I'm gonna kind of switch gears and talk to you. So this is a very, formal title, Family Systems Theory. So this is a real life theory that originated in 1975. And it was originated by a fellow named Murray Bowen. And those of you who may or may, you know, if there's some of you in the group that are clinicians by trade or have been clinicians in your lifetime, you may be very familiar with this. This is like one of the big theories that we learn when we go to counseling school or you know, go to, to study to become a psychologist or a psychiatrist. We have to learn this particular theory, which originated in 1975, as I mentioned. And Mr. Bowen, Dr. Bowen rather, created this family system theory based on his observations of human families and his studies of the natural world. I think that's important that they comment on that idea of the natural world. I'm going to kind of go over the bullets on this slide I'm learning, and then I'm going to kind of zero in on that idea of the natural world for a minute before we go on. So again, family systems theory sees the film as an, the family as an emotional unit, right? So that 
if one person in the family has some emotions going on, be it anxiety or anger or hurt, it has an influence on the rest of the unit, right? So that your emotions are not in isolation, they affect the people around you. And you can think about your own lives, right? In, in your family, if you get angry, it affects the people around you. I mean, they may try to avoid it, they may try to ignore it. The reality is, is it can't help but affect them. And actually, I, I have kind of a funny little anecdote about my own family. There's my tendency at the end of the workday, despite my best efforts, I always would carry home a little bit of the anxiety home with me from the office. And my husband, recognizing the bad days when I was really anxious, he'd say, okay, girls, I had two daughters, mom's on a roll. So that meant that the girls should like probably go and watch TV in another room or just sort of stay clear of mom. She may snap. She might, you know, have a little temper tantrum. I'm happy to tell you that was not often. I definitely have learned to control that. But the bottom line is my anxiety that I took home from work affected the other people in my family unit. Each member of the family interacts with the other members in a reciprocal pattern. And we'll talk a lot more about the patterns. And again, that has to do with that natural world that we talked about a moment ago, that natural world that uh, Dr. Bowen relied upon when he was doing his research. And substance use in the family introduces heightened anxiety into the family environment. And we'll talk a lot more about that today. And Every family is different, right? So I'm gonna give you some, a basic paradigm, a basic system to think about, but recognize that every family, like every individual is different. Every family also has its own particular characteristics, its own particular way of managing the world. So now I'm gonna talk about the natural world. If you think of, you can think of families in two ways. And I think, you know, just sort of dovetailing off that idea of the natural world, think of water, needing its own level, right? So if you're pouring, let's say you're pouring water into something that has several vessels, you'll notice as you pour the water, the water is trying to stay level with itself. That's kind of a way of thinking about the family that the members are always trying to stay level with one another, just like water tries to, tries to meet its own level. That's one way of thinking about it. Another way to think about it is many of us have had in our own homes mobiles, right? So if you think of a famous mobile, the cold, the Calder, the artist Calder was famous for his mobiles. And also I'm gonna show you a graphic in a moment that also is sort of looks like a flat mobile. In fact, I'm gonna to go to that now. So if you think of a mobile, it kind of, if, if the wind blows or if it gets knocked, it kind of moves, it gyrates in a certain way so that the different parts of the mobile either are swinging more, swinging less, bumping into other parts of the mobile. In other words, how the environment externally and internally affects how everyone in that mobile or in that family operates. So as I mentioned, in 1975, Dr. Bowen came up with this, this idea of family systems. This particular mobile or graphic that I'm showing about the addict's family survival roles was not just originated with Bowen, but it was something that was originated around the same time. And I had been in the field since the late 1980s. And this was taught to me along with all the other professionals that I was studying with. And I want you to know for the entire 30 years until very recently, this was it. This was the paradigm. This was what we taught, were taught, what we thought of when we thought of the, uh, the person's, you know, the substance misuser's family and their role in it. So this is a very old theory and it sort of confounded me because when I was doing research for this program today, I thought, oh, someone had to think of something different. I mean, this has been going on for over 30 years. Surely someone has thought of something different. And only very recently has a new paradigm come into play. And I'm going to share that with you today. But just know that this is historically one of the only ways we've learned in the substance use treatment field to think of the family. It is a fairly good way to think of the family, but it kind of pigeonholes people a little bit too much. It's a little too static. And what I'm going to help you with today is think of a more 
um, less linear, less static way of thinking of families ro family roles, and most importantly, how you, the family member trying to help someone you love, can think of them. So I'm going to go over all these different roles and, and sort of tell you what sort of, you know, and you may recognize, and you know what, and these roles don't necessarily only exist in the family that has substance misuse going on in it. Sometimes uh, if there's a mental health problem other than substance use, or maybe you have a family member who suffers from some sort of form of dementia like Alzheimer's disease, sometimes these roles crop up in those families as well. So let's talk about the hero. You know, I, you know, of course, you know, we think of superheroes when we think of heroes, um, but really the hero family member is a really interesting person to think about. So this is the person that's the shining star of the family, right? This is the person that gets good grades. This is the person who goes to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and you know Stanford, all the great schools. This is the person who you know helps, you know, is great to help mom and dad when they need chores being done. So this is the hero, but they look good and achieve well because they want to make sure that they're the public face for the family, so that when they go out into the world. Everyone knows that this is, must be a successful family because look at what they produce, this amazing hero, right? Now the hero could be a spouse, it could be a sibling, it could be, you know, it could be, you know, the cousin that's very close to the family, but whatever the case may be, this is the, the, the portion of the family that gives a good public exterior, right? And they often are compensating for the shame that the family might feel about that substance misuser that's in their midst, right? So, uh, and you'll notice I'm using the word substance misuser or substance user. You're gonna see the word addict here. It's not a terrible word, but we're trying to use it less because it tends again to be kind of feel judgmental for, the, for, for people that are struggling with substance misuse issues. Um, so the, again, the family superstar tries to really, the superhero tries to give a good public face to the family, and they're also compensating for how they're feeling inside, right? So they, oftentimes the hero later in life, after they've moved out of the home and are not living in the family home, oftentimes really starts to struggle. And oftentimes, you know, oftentimes they take up substance misuse, oftentimes they have mental health issues, because they've been sort of repressing all the negative, empty feelings, the helpless feelings that they have inside and try and cover it up by being the hero. So that's one role. The next one is the mascot. I know that's kind of a silly picture. Um, the mascot provides the comic relief for the family that's really hyper-stressed. You know, maybe let's say the father in, in the family is, you know, sort of the classic picture of the the substance misusing family is the father, you know, comes home and, you know, sits in his lazy boy in front of the television set and drinks lots of beers. I know that's very stereotypical, but let's say that's going on in the family. This mascot is the person who sort of all the people that are around dad sitting in his lazy boy are really kind of stressed out. Like, is he going to suddenly lash out? Is he suddenly going to be physically abusive? What's going to happen? You know, and what, you know, and so the mascot kind of keeps things light in the family atmosphere and they use humor to minimize painful situations. So for those of you who have either read the book or seen the film, Angela's Ashes, the person who wrote that book is a good example of a mascot. If you've seen the film, you, you, there's an identified protagonist in the film that's the son of the alcoholic parent and it takes place in Ireland. And he's the, he's the one that's funny and he's the one that keeps things light and, and makes it easier to live in that very painful and poverty stricken situation. Um, another example um, that you might wanna think of if you've seen the film, The Great Santini, and that was also a book. Um, that book also portrays the son is definitely the hero and the daughter, the second one in line, the daughter is the comic relief. She's the mascot. She says lots of funny things. And then there's the scapegoat, which oftentimes introduces two problems into the family that create a lot of stress, because this is the person that actually, rather than the substance user, the scapegoat is the one that gets blamed for all the problems. The scapegoat creates 
problems that kind of shifts the focus away from the substance misuser, but nevertheless, having a scapegoat and a substance misuser in the same environment, in the same family system, can be very, very stressful, can really create problems for everyone in the midst with that person. And they're very, very, you know, they're usually very adroit, you know, so they might have, an, you know, so things that might be going on is, you might be getting calls from the principal about this child if they're still in school, or you might get calls from the local police department saying that this person's been arrested for a DUI. So there might be two substance misusers in the family, that's possible too. Or maybe, uh, maybe this person is getting into scrapes, you know, like having fights, maybe they're abusive of others in some way. It can, the scapegoat can sort of live out their role in a number of different ways. And finally, this is the one that always sort of breaks my heart is what's referred to as the lost child. And this fellow in the picture here looks rather sad. This is the kid that kind of hides both physically, like they basically, as soon as they get home from school, if, if, if this is in a, a family where kids are still young, this is the person who runs up to their room when they get home from school. Um, this is the person that basically hides out both, both physically and emotionally. Uh, they can be counted on not to rock the boat. This is the person that's not going to say adverse things either to the substance misuser or anyone else in the household. They're just going to be a good little boy or girl. And even in an adult child situation, this still is the person who's just not going to say anything that's going to get things to be rocky. Um, they avoid conflicts and suppress their emotions. Again, this, like the hero, this is the person who's been suppressing their feelings. And this actually is true for almost everyone except maybe the scapegoat. This is the person who's really not feeling their feelings. So as they get older and move out of the house, they're going to probably have some attendant long-term sort of trauma-related issues, right? So they've had a sort of a traumatic childhood. And now as an adult, they're grappling with all those feelings they suppressed growing up. Um, during the time that they're in the household with the substance misuser, they're not going to drain the, the family resources to deal with what's going on, but down the road, they're really going to suffer for having kept things under wraps. So we're going to go back to that graphic that I showed a moment ago, and you'll notice that I've reviewed now the hero, scapegoat, lost child, and mascot, but I haven't reviewed the enabler. And if you were able to unmute, and I know you're not able to, you might ask, ask me why. You might also say, gee, all of these things, they just sound so negative. Isn't there any, you know, you know I, I, I'm talking about coping mechanisms that these various members of a family might use. But in particular, I'm not using the word enabler. And I'll explain to you why. First, I'm going to define it for you. And then I'm going to tell you why I have that box and that cross out there. So first, I'm going to define it. And I'm also going to tell you about a book that was written not long after Dr. Bowen developed his family systems theory. I think it was written sort of in the mid to late 80s. It was a book by Melody Beatty called Codependent No More. And she described in particular this particular role, the enabler, the rescuer, the caregiver. Oftentimes it's the spouse. Sometimes it's the eldest child. It kind of really depends. Again, every family is slightly different. But this is the person that got a lot of targeting by folks like myself, folks that were in the substance use treatment field, because this person got a lot of negative feedback from people that were providing therapy to these substance misusing families. Um, we tended to be much more sympathetic to the hero, the scapegoat, the mascot, the lost child, but we, we kind of saved all our vitriol and all of our accusatory statements for this person, the enabler. So this is the person that, you know, that basically insulated the substance misusing person from, from anything that might sort of bring back to the family. So for instance, let's say the substance misuser is supposed to be at work and the boss calls home to find out where's so-and-so, why aren't they at work? the enabler, the spouse or significant other might pick up the phone and say, oh, I'm so sorry, they, you know, they, they uh, overslept, they're not feeling well, they're not coming in today. So the 
so-called enabler is the person who is insulating the substance misuser from what might be happening as a result of their substance use. They're unwilling or unable to hold the individual accountable for their actions. Again, all of this sounds sort of negative, doesn't it? It sounds accusatory, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And they're also the person that sort of smooths everything over, runs interference, keeps the substance misuser from experiencing the consequences of their substance use and of their poor choices. So, oops, I'm not gonna go there just yet. Let's talk a little bit more about, um, so a lot of you are very familiar with this idea of codependence. And I'm, you know, I really want to, to say a little bit about what I'm going to next. So what we've learned is that sort of focusing on this codependent spouse or significant other or family member and referring to them in a pejorative and negative way as an enabler, someone who enabled the substance misuse to happen as though they are equally responsible with the person that's struggling with the substance use problem tended not to be as helpful as we would have hoped. What tends to happen is that person you know, think about it is if anyone has ever pointed a finger at you and accused you of something negative, your tendency would be to go on the defensive, right? You would say, well, not me, maybe it's so-and-so, but it's not me. Or, you know, why would you point the finger at me? It's not me that's the problem in the family. It's that substance misuser. I thought right away puts the person on the, on the defensive. It also might make them feel less inclined to support the treatment process because the treatment provider has, again, accused them and made them feel bad about themselves. So the next thing that happened, and it only happened, as I mentioned, this same paradigm, the same way of treating families has been going on since 1975, straight through up until the mid to late 90s. And then a guy named Robert Weiss, W-E-I-S-S, came up with a different idea. He calls it pro-dependence. He wrote a book about it. Hold on. Yeah. It's called Pro-Dependence, The End of Codependency. It's by Robert Weiss, who is a PhD and also has a master's in social work. He actually is mostly famous for treating people with um, sexual problems, sexual, so not, you know, so it's a non-substance addiction problem that someone has with sexual behaviors. So that was his specialty, but just like with substance misusers, the people that were treating sexual problems were treating family members the same way, right? So the spouse or significant other or family member that was enabling the sexual conduct of the person that was struggling was also given sort of a bad rap. So Robert Weiss thought, this is not effective. We need to think of something differently. So what he began to talk about was this thing called pro-dependence. So let me give you an example that kind of comes from a different place. So if my beloved husband of nearly 32 years was diagnosed with cancer, would anyone label or judge me or do everything I could, you know, wouldn't I be trying to do everything I could for him, including giving up important aspects of my life? If that happened to my husband, I might take a leave of absence from work. I might, um, you know, I might come into work, you know, if I continue working, I might be coming in really bedraggled and tired. I might, you know, tell, you know, he's not working currently, but I might tell the people that he's obligated to for various volunteer work that he does, that he's going to take a, a break from volunteering. Well, the same thing would happen, frankly, if I had, if my husband was misusing substances, right? I still would need to do everything I could to help him get better. So pro-dependence really kind of takes a look at this family systems argument that's kind of against the person that's trying to help them the most and sort of flips it on its head. So let's talk about, so the enabler, you know, has been viewed since 1975 in a pejorative way. Um, with codependence, we, we're not gonna talk about an enabler anymore. We're gonna really kind of talk about 
empathy, that the person living with the substance misuser is engaging in empathy, trying, you know, and we, the, the people that are trying to help this family, is exercising empathy, saying, gee, this must be so stressful for you. Oh, this must be really difficult. How can I help? Right? So we're going to exercise empathy. We're also going to recognize that instead of that family system of interdependent relationships being a negative, a pejorative, we're gonna see that the fact that all these people are connected in intimate ways is really important, but that we also recognize that each person is entitled to an independent life, right? So their connectedness as well as their independentness is valued. Um, we're going to always support people's strengths versus castigating them for their vulnerabilities, right? We're trying to really support what's good in them, right? Wow, the fact that you've hung in there with this person in your family for such a long time, you know, kudos to you because we know that you've worked really hard to hold your family together and we really think the world of you for doing that. And you know, just like I just said, we're recognizing and, and celebrating the loved one's willingness to stay connected, to support that loved one, that substance misuser that they care about. So just to sort of further define and clarify the difference between that idea of codependency versus pro-dependency. So a lot of times some of the negative traits that we see in codependence like being enmeshed, overly involved with your family member. Instead of saying overly involved and enmeshed, we say deeply involved, right? That puts a different spin on it, right? It sort of gives you a sense that we're supporting the fact that you're really engaged in this, this family member's life. Um, another sort of negative thing that we would talk about is that instead of worrying about yourself, you're too externally focused. You're too worried about other people and not worried enough about yourself. Well, in a pro-dependent viewpoint, we're saying, God bless you for being so concerned about your loved ones. Thank goodness you're really focusing on these other people to help them get, you know, to help them straighten out their lives. Again, rather than enabling, we're supporting. Um, now, here's, here's the slippery place. It, it can't help but be true, either on the codependent side or the pro-dependent side, that there's going to be some boundary violations, right? It is possible that family members for someone with a substance use problem might not have great boundaries, right? They might be, to use the negative phrase, over-involved. But again, we don't want to spin it that way. We want to say that it's great to see that they're eager to care for their loved one and help them set healthy boundaries. So this is where it's sort of hard to delineate the two. We have to acknowledge that there's boundary violations going on, but we want to help them in a healthy, positive, you know, we want to help them get their independence while staying connected with their loved one. So this idea of boundaries is probably the place, you know, if the rubber is going to meet the road anywhere, it's on the issue of boundaries. Here's something that's living in denial. What a negative thing to say to someone, you're in denial, right? Well, you know, denial, the Nile is a river in Egypt. We're not going to worry about denial. We're going to worry about the person's, or we're going to care about the fact that the person is not willing to give up on someone that has caused them a lot of pain and has caused them a lot of grief, but they're willing to put up with that because they love that person. And that's how we want to frame it. And finally, and this is another really negative way of characterizing someone who's caring for a family member is to call them controlling and overbearing. Um, maybe they're just trying to be heard. Maybe, you know, they're, they're maybe using ways of approaching that loved one that are not successful and are not working well, but after all, they're just trying to get heard and they're just trying to, to fix what's wrong in their, in their family system. So that's kind of defining everything for you. But of course, you're not just here to get definitions. You're here to, to learn a little bit about what do I do if this is going on in my family or in, in a, you know, a friend's family or it's going on with a friend. What do I do? So what's a family member to do? What's a friend to do? What's a colleague to do? Well, there are things to do. Before I show you the bullets on this slide, what I want to do is kind of share with you three basic things that you can say 
through loved ones who seem to be struggling or to a family member that seems to be struggling. You can say loved one, family member. Let's say, let's say their name is Joseph. So Joseph, you know that I adore you. I really, I care about you. I'm worried about you. I'm concerned. Whatever feels comfortable in the moment, but express some in some way, shape, or form caring from for that person that you're trying to help. I'm worried about you. I'm concerned about you. And then the second thing you want to say is, here's what I notice. I notice that your family's really stressed out. I notice that so and so having difficulties. You know, I notice that so and so in your family is is struggling with substances and you know maybe it's not that open right maybe that's being too personal but you might just say i notice that there's a lot of stress in your family or i notice that so and so is really struggling to get to the, their appointments on time or i really notice so and so is is has been really kind of sedated lately is everything okay and then the so that's the second thing first i Here's what I care about. I care about you. Here's what I notice. I notice this, that, or the other thing. And finally, can I help? In what way can I help you? You know, do, you know would you like a referral to someone who can help you? You know, so, so some sort of gesture of, I have some ideas. I know someone who could help, you know, or you just want to talk. Sometimes just giving them an opportunity to talk about what's stressing them is enough for that moment. And they might say, no, thank you. I'm fine. And then you say, you know what? That's cool. But, you know, maybe down the road, if you think of something that I can help with, I'm here. You know, I'm here for you. So that's some basic stuff that I wanted to review before I show the bullets here. And some of the bullets might contain some of what I just told you. So no matter what, whoever's involved, you're going to continue loving them no matter what. It's okay. No one, you know, don't, who cares if they call you an enabler? Who cares if they say you're too enmeshed? You're, it's okay to keep on loving the family member who's having problems. Stay attached. You know, they, they may say you have to detach, you have to kick them out, you have to shut the door on them. You know, in some way, shape, or form, it's fine to stay attached. It's fine to stay connected. Um, you, the family member that's trying to help, or if you know someone who has these issues in their family, you want to acknowledge that a little self-care might be good. Ask them if they're doing some yoga. Ask them how they're eating, what their exercise and diet regimen is all about. Are they, you know, maybe meditating, or are they involved with their faith community? Are they going to services? Are they worshiping? Are they connecting with other people that are healthy in their life to sort of balance out all the time they're spent it, spending with the person who's not doing so well, right? So self-care is a big, big, big one. And if you're the family member that's struggling, take care of you, right? You might still be connected with that person that's misusing substances, but they're, they're not more important than you. You maybe have given them a lot of attention, but you're important too, and you need to give yourself some love. Of course, you might Think about things for these loved ones, therapy, ACOA, which is adult children of alcoholics. So if you know an adult child or you yourself are, are an adult child of a substance misuser, this is a good program for you. Some of you may be familiar with Al-Anon, which is generally, though not always for family members, but specifically, it really tends to be about spouses of people that are misusing alcohol. And then another one, and this is in the resources that I sent to Michelle and Roseanne, is SMART Recovery. What separates SMART Recovery from some of the other ones that I mentioned, the ACOA or Al-Anon, is it has no connection to spirituality or religion. So this is oftentimes for people that really don't want any kind of religious or Christian sounding um, things to be said in a support meeting. So all of these, except for therapy, are support groups that are for free. Uh, therapy generally is not gonna be for free, but both CJE and JCFS Chicago have support groups for people that are struggling with these kinds of, who are struggling with some similar issues to this. You know, and obviously Roseanne can tell you what, if any support groups exist. And of course we do have some support groups, not specifically for substance use, but for family members that are struggling with other members of their family that are struggling.
And finally, and I, of course, have already emphasized this a lot, self-care is really the big deal. And again, be aware that much like with substances, if you think about if you're struggling with a loved one who has Alzheimer's disease or some form of dementia, um, a lot, you, probably a lot of what I've talked about today sort of rings similarly. It does, when someone has an issue like that or another mental health issue like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or some other serious mental health problem, tends to, to really affect the family in a similar way. So a lot of this stuff, well, you know, my, my focus is on families that have, or, or systems that have substance use problems the substance misuse problems, it really can be mirrored in a lot of different families with different mental health problems in them. And some of you might be asking, what, if, what about little kids? You know, I, I'm a grandparent and I, my child is living in a household with parents, a parent or a sibling that's abusing substances or misusing substances. So actually there is help for them. And um, there is something called Alateen for kids that have parents or family members with substance use problems. But this is really, it's called the seven C's. And it's really, you know, how do I talk to my grandchild or my, my, um, my sister or brother's teenage child? And this is really a great way to look at it. I'm certainly not responsible for it, right? I didn't cause this problem. Because a lot of times, you know, if you, read about or think about kids that are in families where divorces happen, a lot of times the kids feel responsible for causing a divorce. It's very similar with kids from substance misusing families as they somehow think that if they just behaved a little better, you know, like that lost child that I defined that somehow that they're, they're you know, it's, it's this worry that they might be in some way, shape or form um, responsible. And then of course, for those hero kids and those mascots and those scapegoats, scapegoats, they need to know that they can't cure it either. Their behavior is not going to fix it in any way, shape, or form. They certainly can't control it. They can't make mom, dad, siblings stop using. And they can't by themselves take care of that person. They may try to. A lot of times the eldest sibling takes care of the substance misusing parent. And they need to really communicate, you know, the, the, the lost child, the scapegoat, all of those uh, roles that I talked about, those are people that are tending not to communicate their feelings. So the extent to which we can really encourage family members to share about their feelings, the better. Um, and again, that self-care, making healthy choices. And finally, rather than you know using those pejorative ideas and those pejorative names, we're going to celebrate the person that's in that family because they hung in there. They stayed in that family. They didn't escape that family. They hung in there and stayed connected. So I think that pretty much is where we're at at the wrap up in questions. I'm going to just leave this uh, contact slide up for just a half second so you can either call me. That's my office phone. And even though I'm not in the office every day due to COVID, I do visit the office at least once a week, usually twice a week. Plus, if you call that 847-745-5457 number, at the very least, I'll get an email and you can leave a message and actually your message will be transcribed and I'll get a voicemail too. And also emailing me is really easy, Nina Henry at jcfs.org. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing. I see that there is some stuff uh, in the Q&A. So this will allow Roseanne to let me know what you're asking about and what you're commenting about. Hi, Nina. Um, so there's not many questions in the Q&A, actually. Wow. Uh, yeah, you, and you did cover so much, but, but certainly we can use this time. One of the things I want to be sure that you do is identify your role at JCFS. We use you as a consultant for good reason. You're so full of information. This presentation was wonderful. Okay. You're such a good support to all of us. But to clarify for folks what you can do, if they give you a call, what you can so provide. If, thank you for that. So if you call me, um, and it really can be, it doesn't have to be about you. It can be a family member, friend, colleague, as I said earlier. If you call or email me, uh, first of all, everything is completely confidential. 
Um, you know, really no one is going to know anything that you've told me. So just like services at CJE, we are very devoted to keeping your information anonymous. Um, what I will do is, you know, actually I've gotten calls over the six and a half years I've been with JCFS from all over the country from, and from out of the country, from Israel, from actually I even got a call from Luxembourg. So I know, let's say as an example, you have uh, a significant other who's living with someone who is using, misusing substances and is living with someone who's misusing substances and you want to send them out of state. I know places in California, in Tennessee, in Arizona, in New Jersey and Connecticut. So, so in other words, geographic location is not an obstacle. Mm -hmm. I also, you know, will want to know you know, who, you know, if the identified substance misuser has insurance. I can help you find a program that takes that insurance. I can also help you find a program. So, for instance, in the state of Illinois, there are still substance use treatment programs that are for people that are unfunded because we have a state, you know, some of these programs have a contract with the state. And so someone who has no insurance could still get treatment in the state of Illinois and not so far from Chicago. So uh, there's some in Chicago and then outlying areas. So I can really help you, you and your family members because also I can get you to a, a support group. I can get you to some sort of fellowship. And also programming. We do a lot of programming for families that you know are struggling with substance misuse in their families. So I can also connect you with our listserv so you can know when those programs are going on. I think that covers everything. It's it's wonderful. It's such a good overview. So we want to clarify for folks, you're going to get people where they need to go. You're not providing the addiction treatment yourself, but you're our person in the Federation who's just full of information and direction who can get us where we yeah. need to go, which Thanks is for wonderful. clarifying. Thank and, you. and there has been a question asked about the resource list. We have the resource list. We're going to follow up after the program by emailing it. And I believe Michelle's also going to put a link in here. I know we're going to do a link with the program evaluation in, yeah. in um, the program directly, but we're also going to email everyone the resource list plus an evaluation of the program. Um, afterwards. I think um, one of the questions, again, somebody does want to see your email again. So okay. if we can, can I put that in the chat, that, am I able to yeah. do that? If you would put that in the chat, um, that would be great. We also can include it in that follow up information that we're going to send in the email. We absolutely great. want people to be able to reach you. There we go. It's in the chat um, in the Q&A. And the, another question someone asked was, how do, how do we help the misuser get beyond their guilt? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think the best way to characterize it, you, you, you may remember my little um, analogy about my husband having cancer. It's kind of, I think that's the way to go to say, you know, this is a brain disease, right? This is a disease that it really affects a very specific specific part of the brain. And we think of it, we can think of it like diabetes or other chronic illnesses. And so they're, you know, they may have a genetic predisposition, you know, maybe a, a grandparent has, has had this substance use problem in the past. So they may have gotten that gene or, you know, but the bottom line is they're not respond, they're not bad people. They're good people in all likelihood with a really terrible disease that can really harm lives. And, and so that's one way of helping them. I mean, I don't think anyone, you know, wakes up on, you know, on, on their a day in second grade when the teacher asks you, what do you want to be when you grow up? No one raises their hand and says, I really want to be a substance misuser, right? No one is planning this, right? And, and that's part of the reason why we say substance misuse, because for instance, older adults, you know, really unknowingly and, and younger people too, but it's really common with older adults might get say a prescription for opiates. And because, you know, maybe they didn't ask all the questions they needed to of the doctor about, you know, can I take more than one when I'm feeling a lot of pain? They may start misusing the substance and before they know it, they become physically dependent on it. They didn't mean to do that. They didn't mean to cause a problem with themselves or anyone else. So again, I don't, I don't think anyone sets out to, to have this problem, it, it just happens to some people. 
<laughs> people are are saying that they can't see your contact information. It's in the chat. Are folks able to open the chat? Um, unfortunately, we can't type into the Q and A, which makes. Oh, it I was just going to ask that. I was just going to try and do that before I had to go on my phone in order to put in what I did on the Q and A. So we're a little stymied in, in being able to do that. We absolutely will include Nina's contact information in the follow up email. It's essential. I want everyone to be able to reach out to her. And if you have any problem accessing Nina, reach out to me. So I'm Roseanne Corcoran. I'm at CJE. I put the program together here. I'm happy to direct everyone I can to Nina. And she's done it before. We've been working oh. together for a long time. We so use I can, you can count on Roseanne. And I think yeah. you probably can count on Michelle too if you end up. Yeah. We're, we're contacting we her you, instead. We we want you to know who Nina is. We want you to use her. She's an essential service and support for us as professionals, but also for us as family members. And, and not just in working with older adults, with any family member. Nina and the program at JCFS Chicago are excellent. So let's know and use. I did want to say what a wonderfully positive pr presentation, Nina. I think we've mentioned the words, you know, enabler and codependent and the negative um, reaction that we all have to those labels. I so appreciate you reframing that and saying we've moved past that. Yay. We a, <laughs> yeah. We had a low attendance in the program today and I'm going to tell you, it has a lot to do with the stigma that, yeah. that this issue carries. People yep. might not want to be seen in a program and we didn't unfortunately communicate that you can't see who else is in the program. There's a risk in attending and acknowledging. So right. I think it's just, it's a loaded topic and we have to normalize it. Every yep. family, every family carries this risk. Every family, this is just part of who we are. It, it is- Part of the human condition, truly. Yeah. And so the more- One in 10 of us, it's very common. Yes, absolutely. And, and so the more we normalize this and don't, cause shame and, and normalize not only the experience of the person with the issues, but also the family members. It just, what a great reframe, Nina. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. It's, it's my mission in life, it feels like, to really destigmatize these problems so that people feel comfortable reaching out and getting treatment. And part of the reason we've had this horrible issue with overdose is that people were so isolated and did feel stigmatized and didn't reach out the extent that that you know they actually could have if you know and, and people were afraid also because of COVID to go into public spaces and hospitals so you know the more we reach out and the more we mm -hmm. as you put it normalize and destigmatize these issues you know the the more we'll cut into that and and make that less of a problem in future and Michelle is pointing out that if folks look in the Q&A now she has responded and put Nina's email in there. So it is Nina Henry, all one word, no dots, at jcfs.org. And it is in the chat. Great. Um, and as well, we will follow up with the resource list and absolutely with Nina's um, contact information. And if folks can complete the evaluation to let us, you know, give us feedback on the program, that will be great. Um, our Very next helpful. Insights on Yes, yes. It's always good to get feedback so we know what we're doing. So we know if you want more. So I can be better next time, right? I want to get yeah. better. <laughs> um, and our next program will be in August and it will be actually on aging and delirium. How to minimize the risk of delirium. Margaret Dan Danolovich in our research department has a great presentation on that topic. But we're certainly willing to have Nina back at any point and to continue to have this conversation, which has been wonderful. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Roseanne, it's always great to do these uh, things with you and to be sort of, you know, collaborating with CJE, which is, again, you know, just as Roseanne said, glowing things about JCFS, we have collaborated with CJE umpteen times over the years and have never, you know, been disappointed as always, and a, a really yeah. positive yeah. add-on for us as well. And, and so yeah. we're re really grateful for the collaboration. Absolutely. All right. Um, and, and I know some folks are still saying they can't see your contact information. It is Nina Henry, 
at jcfs.org. Um, and we will share that with all participants afterwards. We'll send an email. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks, today. everyone.